Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I am Hira Mustafa and these are the headlines. Qatar says there has been movement on resolving a bitter diplomatic dispute among the Gulf countries. Foreign Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani made these comments to an Italian diplomatic conference, but he did not predict whether a breakthrough was imminent. Pakistan has condemned Israel over its decision to build new settlements in the occupied East Jerusalem. In a statement, the Foreign Office said Israeli actions violate international law and UN resolutions. It also reaffirmed Pakistan's firm support for the Palestinians' right to self-determination and statehood. Pakistan has called for debt suspension and drawing rights of $500 billion to prevent an economic collapse due to COVID-19. Prime Minister Imran Khan was virtually addressing a special session by the UN General Assembly on response to the pandemic. Khan proposed a 10-point agenda for economic recovery. The U.S. has reported the highest ever coronavirus deaths and cases in a day. The country recorded 2,879 deaths and more than 217,000 infections overnight. India remains the second worst hit nation with more than 139,000 deaths and 9.5 million cases so far. When the last 24 hours, Pakistan has registered 55 fatalities and over 3,200 cases with a death toll crossing 8,000. The global deaths from the coronavirus have exceeded 1.5 million while the tally of infections has crossed 65 million. And in cricket, the first one international between England and South Africa has been postponed after one of the South African players tested positive for coronavirus. The match will now take place on Sunday. Well, these were the headlines, news in detail coming after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back and now the news in detail. Qatar says there has been movement on resolving a bitter diplomatic dispute among the Gulf countries. Foreign Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani made these comments to an Italian diplomatic conference. Al Thani said the, that he could not predict whether a breakthrough was imminent or would fully resolve the matter, denying reports that a resolution may only include some of the blockading countries. He said any re solution must be holistic. He said Doha believes the end of the crisis is important for regional security and the people. Al Thani asserted that no state party is in a position for to place demands on the the other. Pakistan has condemned Israel over its decision to build new settlement units in the occupied East Jerusalem. In a statement, the Foreign Office said Israeli actions against Palestine violate international law and UN resolutions. It also reaffirmed Islamabad's firm support for the Palestinians' right to self-determination and statehood. The Foreign Office called for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In November, Israel announced plans to build a further 1,257 settler homes in the occupied East Jerusalem. Pakistan has called for debt suspension and drawing rights of 500 billion US dollars to prevent an economic collapse due to COVID-19. Prime Minister Imran Khan was virtually addressing a special session by the UN General Assembly on response to the pandemic. More in the following report. Prime Minister Imran Khan proposed a 10-point agenda for economic recovery at the summit. He said developing countries are facing a dilemma on how to stimulate the economy and reduce budget deficit at the same time. 
Khan said Islamabad provided a relief package of around $8 billion to support the poor and to keep the economy afloat during the pandemic. The Prime Minister also proposed the creation of a new liquidity and sustainability facility to provide short-term loans at lower costs. He said the agreed target of mobilizing $100 billion per year for climate action in developing countries must also be met. Khan called for immediate action to stop the massive illicit financial outflows from developing countries to rich countries. He said stolen assets stashed in rich countries must be returned. The prime minister expressed hope that whenever a vaccine is available, it must be offered to everyone. In Pakistan, 55 people have died of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, pushing the death toll to 8,260. The health ministry says more than 3,200 people tested positive for the virus overnight. The ministry said that the country's active cases have crossed 51,000. It added that out of nearly 410,000 countrywide cases, more than 350,000 people have recovered. The U.S. has reported the highest ever coronavirus deaths and cases in a single day. The country recorded 2,879 deaths and more than 217,000 infections overnight. India remains the second worst hit nation with more than 139,000 deaths and 9.5 million cases so far. The global deaths from the coronavirus have exceeded 1.5 million, while the tally of infections has crossed 65 million. More in the following report. Now that UK has approved the emergency rollout of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, the world has gone into a frenzy. Doubts, second thoughts, competition, sighs of relief and hurried preparations go hand in hand after the first major breakthrough. The situation remains grim in the US as President-elect Joe Biden said he will ask Americans to wear masks for his first 100 days in the office. And New York's governor says the only way to come out of this grim situation is to fight off the pandemic with a vaccine. This is the weapon that is going to win the war. And that is the light at the end of the tunnel, right? So uh, it's not tomorrow. It's not a short tunnel. But we know the way through this. We just have to get there. And we have to get there with as little loss of life as possible. Moderna said it expects to have up to 125 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine available globally in the first quarter of 2021. France announced that it will ensure free COVID-19 vaccinations for all in its social security system, while Belgium's Brussels airport is ramping up preparations for the mission of the century to handle the transport of vaccines. The volumes here will be huge, huge, huge. It really be going to be a tsunami of vaccines uh, coming through this airport. And then you need to be very well prepared. Eh? If you are not prepared for a tsunami, then you get lost. Eh? Meanwhile, China has delivered over 1 million doses of a COVID-19 vaccine developed by Sinovac to Brazil for late-stage testing in 16 locations. Top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fossey has apologized for casting doubt on the rigor of British regulators. Earlier, London's Madison regulators dismissed Fossey's criticism and defended their approval of the Pfizer vaccine. In an interview, Dr. Fossey said he had faith in the quality of work of British regulators. He said he did not mean to imply any sloppiness, even though it came out that way. Earlier, Fossey had said UK regulators rushed the approval process. The UK became the first country on the 2nd of December to approve a coronavirus vaccine. Iran has urged the International Atomic Energy Agency to condemn the assassination of its top nuclear scientist. In a letter, Iran's permanent representative, Qasim Gariba Badi, called Mohsen Fakhrizadeh's killing a terrorist attack. Gariba Badi said terrorist attacks against Iranian nuclear scientists began a decade ago. He said these require proper attention from the international community and organizations. Earlier, Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, said Tehran proved its bona fides in 15 IAEA reports. He said the next U.S. administration must prove its goodwill by complying fully with Security Council resolutions. Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan and his Iranian counterpart Hassan Rouhani have discussed steps to improve bilateral ties. 
In a statement, Turkey's communication directorate said Erdogan offered condolences over the killing of Iran's top scientists over the phone. The Turkish president said the assassination targeted regional peace and stability. He said those who want to drag the region into instability will fail. The directorate said the two leaders also discussed regional issues. Top Iranian leaders, including President Hassan Rouhani, have accused Israel of orchestrating the attack. U.S. lawmakers have agreed on defense legislation that will force the government to sanction Turkey for buying a Russian missile system. The $740 billion defense bill is expected to pass Congress this month. The National Defense Authorization Act establishes curbs on Ankara within 30 days of becoming law. But President Donald Trump has threatened to veto the annual defense spending legislation. Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu said Ankara is ready to negotiate the issue with the present administration or the next one. Turkey and the U.S. have stressed the need to support the Afghan peace process. U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan, Zalmi Khalil Saad, and Turkey's Deputy Foreign Minister said that Onel met in Ankara. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said it was imperative that parties build on the current momentum to bring peace in Afghanistan. It said the stakeholders must escalate efforts to define a political roadmap and reach a comprehensive ceasefire. Meanwhile, Turkey's foreign ministry said Ankara welcomed the recent progress in Afghan peace negotiations. Khalil Zah said he will also travel to Qatar to help the warring sides in Afghanistan build on the success of their recent agreement. Russia says it tracked 36 foreign aircraft near its state border over the past week. State media says 30 foreign spy planes and six drones were conducting air re reconnaissance. It said they violated international border laws. It quoted the Defense Ministry as saying it mobilized two fighter jets to prevent the violations. Earlier in an interview, Air Force Deputy Commander Andrew Yudin said over 1,300 foreign spy planes have been intercepted in 2020 so far. He said the quick alert forces have been scrambled more than 170 times to intercept foreign planes near the borders. And now it's time to take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back and now moving on to UK says it aims to cut carbon emissions by at least 68% of what they were in 1990 by 2030. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the ambitious target which sets London on the path to net zero by 2050. In a statement, Johnson said the goal will see Britain cutting emissions faster than any major economy so far. He urged other world leaders to follow his lead at a virtual UN climate summit on December 12. Earlier, London said it will replace carbon-emitting cars and vans with electric ones by 2030. Scientists have welcomed the news but say it does not guarantee dangerous climate change will be avoided. The Wisconsin Supreme Court has rejected a lawsuit by President Donald Trump attempting to overturn his loss to Joe Biden in the battleground state. The top court said the parties could pursue a case in a lower court. The petition alleged Wisconsin election officials were directed to fill in missing information on ballot envelopes. It said they issued absentee ballots without receiving applications and allowed people to improperly claim a confined absentee voting status. It also said officials in Madison City collected and checked ballots in city parks and not polling stations, which is against state law. The legal defeat on a 4-3 ruling was the latest in a string of losses for Trump's post-election lawsuits. He has claimed without any evidence that the election was rigged and marred by widespread fraud. China says it firmly opposes Vant and U.S. operation of its companies after Washington blacklisted its top chip mark maker and oil giant. The U.S. earlier blacklisted China's top chip maker, SMIC, and oil giant CNO-OC over alleged military links. 
Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Chunying asked Washington to stop abusing the concept of national security. Hua said malicious U.S. activities will severely harm America's interests and international image. Meanwhile, in an article, U.S. Director of National Intelligence called China the biggest threat to democracy since World War II. John Radcliffe said Beijing intends to dominate the U.S. and the rest of the planet economically, militarily and technologically. In the UK, the Glow Wild Winter Lantern Festival is back for the seventh year. This year, the festival celebrates the hidden heroes of the plant and fungal world. More in the following report. As winter draws in, one country house in England delighted visitors with its annual winter light show. Wakehurst in Sussex has installed over a thousand lanterns across its gardens. The Glow Wild Festival never fails to transform the area into a winter wonderland. We came last year and I feel like this year is really, it's really outstanding, it's much even better than last year. Um, I feel like the whole trail, like we love walking around the lanterns with the kids, it's just really magical. Um, and more so this year and the fire, the lake, literally everything. Oh yes, literally we've enjoyed out to everything. This year the designs have been inspired by workings of nature that generally go unnoticed such as the spores of plant settling and the work of fungi in enriching the landscape. A staggering 33,000 plants have been illuminated, making it a truly immersive experience for the visiting families. It's a layer added onto the Wakehurst landscape. Uh, we have something amazing here. We have these great stately trees. We have beautiful undulations and valleys within Wakehurst. And what we don't want to do is to offer something utterly different and distracting. We actually want to enhance what's here. So it's subtlety, it's, it's light, it's sound. It's um, a sort of sensory layer that we add onto the landscape to really kind of bring the place at night to life for our visitors. COVID-19 presented challenges to the annual feature, which for many residents signifies the countdown to Christmas. Lanterns had to be mailed out to staff to assemble in their homes. A monk in Myanmar is working for animal rights in a unique way. He saves snakes destined for culling and the black market. More in the following report. Tenderly stroking the back of a large Burmese python, resting on his lap, but this monk Velatha is trying to play a part in saving scores of snakes that might otherwise be killed or destined to be smuggled overseas as food or traditional medicine. The 69-year-old monk has created a refuge for snakes at a monastery in the bustling commercial city of Yangon. He takes in various species from pythons to vipers and cobras. I always check their health and condition every morning as I feel from the bottom of my heart that they are my sons and daughters. Since its launch five years ago, residents and government agencies have been bringing captured snakes to the monk. The monk said residents in mainly Buddhist Myanmar hope to gain merit by giving captured snakes to a monk rather than killing or selling them. In Buddhism, one of four great devas, celestial beings, is a snake guardian. In other words, the snakes are related to the deva world. If you kill a snake, you will suffer bad luck to your family, have a broken family, cause deadly disease and destroy business. The snakes are kept at the monastery until the forest authority sets a date to release them into protected sanctuaries. In the meantime, the snakes, which are used to hunting live prey, have to be manually fed fish or other meat two or three times a month. The ascender of China's Chang'e 5 probe carrying lunar samples has blasted off from the moon. This marks the first time that a spacecraft launched by China has taken off from an extraterrestrial body. More about the space mission in this report. China's Chang'e 5 probe launched on the 22nd of November is the first attempt by any nation to retrieve samples from the moon since the 1970s. In recent developments, the probe's ascender took off from the moon and reached a scheduled lunar orbit in around six minutes. This lunar liftoff is very successful. The ascender took off on schedule and reached the scheduled orbit precisely, laying a good foundation for the next work because our task is to take samples and send them back. The ascender has to take off on schedule to dock with the return vehicle. The task of sampling and return are interlocked. 
so we must complete all of them successfully. Besides, the lunar liftoff also conquered many other challenges, including limited divergent space for the Indian plume and different environments between Earth and the Moon. The ascender is expected to complete the unmanned rendezvous and docking with the orbiter returner in lunar orbit. The samples will be transferred to the returner. Through four long-term adjustments, we will adjust the ascender to a proper position in relation to the orbiter and complete the renders woes. We are more confident now and look forward to its return with the lunar samples. When the geometric relationship between the Earth and the Moon is suitable, the orbiter will carry the returner back to the Earth. The Chang E5 probe will seek to collect material that can help scientists understand more about the Moon's origins and formation. And now moving on to the business stories, Britain says post-Brexit trade talks with the European Union are in a difficult phase. Talking to Media Business Secretary Alok Sharma said a deal can only be struck if EU accepts that Britain is a sovereign nation. Sharma said there are some tricky issues that still need to be resolved. Meanwhile, French European Affairs Minister Clement Bion says if a good deal is not reached, there are chances of a veto. He said Paris will reject any deal which does injustice to its fishermen producers and citizens. Less than four weeks are left until the UK finally exits the EU's orbit on December 31st. Most European stocks are trading higher as investors monitor prospects of a US stimulus package and a last-minute Brexit trade deal. The pan-European stock 600 has edged fractionally above the flat line. The CAC 40 in Paris, London's FTSE and at least FTSE MIB have all edged up. But Frankfurt's DAX has shed marginally. Earlier, most Asian bursts gained except for mainland Chinese and Japanese shares. West Indies have won this year's Spirit of Cricket Award after sending both their men's and women's team to tour England during the pandemic. The honour was announced by Mary Lebon Cricket Club, which acts as a custodian and arbiter of cricket laws. The MCC also praised the boards of Pakistan, Ireland and Australia for allowing their teams to play in England. When Dice arrived in England in June in a biosecure environment, which saw international cricket resume for the first time since the coronavirus outbreak. The women featured in the 2020 international series against England in September after India and South Africa were unable to tour. Jason Holder's West Indies side won a similar award from the Cricket Writers Club in October. And in cricket, the first one day international between England and South Africa has been postponed after a Proteus player tested positive for coronavirus. Cricket South Africa said in the interest of the safety of both teams, it was decided to postpone the series opener by two days. This is the first English match to be postponed because of the positive case since the outbreak of the pandemic. All matches are being played without fans with restrictions similar to those at England's home fixtures in the summer. The match will now take place on Sunday. In football, AC Milan came from two goals behind to beat Celtic 4-2 at San Siro in a European League encounter. Milan are now second in Group H, having scored 10 points from five matches. Tom Rogic and Odson Edward put Celtic in control after just 14 minutes of the first half. But goals from Hakan Selhanglu, Samuel Castillo, Peter Hogg and Brahim Diaz sealed the crucial fixture for the hosts. In another fixture, Arsenal beat Rapid Vine 4-1 at Emirates Stadium in a Group B encounter. Alexander Lacazette, Pablo Mari and Adi Nikatia made the scoreline 3-0 at the interval. Koya Kitagawa scored one for Rapid Vine just before the interval. But a 66-minute goal from Emil Simet rove sealed things for the Gunners. Atletico Madrid forward Luis Suarez is set to return to action this weekend after returning a negative COVID-19 test. He tested positive on international duty last month and missed Uruguay's win over Colombia and defeat by Brazil. Suarez also missed Atletico Madrid's last four fixtures. He joined Atleti from Barcelona in the last transfer window and has scored five goals in six La Liga appearances 
from the Roji Blancos. Diego Simon's side currently sits second in La Liga on 23 points, one point behind leaders Real Sociedad. And now it's time to have a look at the weather update across the globe. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.